What is it like watching it? It's, it's 10 years of your life. Yeah. Or parts of 10 yeah. years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years starting quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Uh, didn't we look young, I suppose. Mm. Yes. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. And we're all young and cute looking and, you know, long hair, shiny, puppy like. Mm. <laughs> but shit hot too, you know. Mm. The music's intense and. Does it bring back memories? Uh, well, yes, yes. I mean, um, especially. I really enjoyed the Albert Hall stuff because it is very early days mm. and I remember the feeling that we had um, in those early concerts because we just we just come back from America <coughs> and people didn't really know much about us in, in England. The concerts we'd done were all small pubs and clubs and universities and that. Mm. And uh, people used to come by word of mouth, you know, there was no press mm. particularly around. Uh, they didn't really know what we were doing. And then we went to America, and then we made a name in America, and then the English press kind of got hold of that. And then when we came back to do, um, do the Albert Hall, suddenly everybody went, ah, there's this great American band, and they're coming over, and we can get to see them. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, no, we are English. And, uh, mm. But uh, I suppose the Albert Hall was a sort of, here we are, and this is what we do, and, you know, look out type of thing. There's great swagger and bravado and, and it all comes across on the DVD I think. Mm. So uh, it's, it's exciting to watch. If you compare with like the feeling of standing there uh, at the Royal Albert Hall mm. to the, the last episodes on Nebworth mm -hmm. from 1979, mm. what's the difference? For me the more interesting thing is the similarity. Um, the same commitment is there on the stage. You tend, once you walk on stage and the music starts, you tend to forget about everything else. And then immediately it's, it's the eye contact and listening for cues and listening and, and, you know, a lot of concentration on stage in a Zeppelin concert. You know, you've got to be ready and, you know, you can't drift off thinking about things. It's, uh, <coughs> and, and that was there right from the first shows right to the end. You know, you can see it in Nebworth. Everybody's was still like, Bonzo and I are still watching each other. And, making sure everything was right and right place and is constant adjusting and you know, musically I'm, I mean you know, just and that was that was always there mm. and every concert is given the same commitment and the same weight and the same treatment mm. whether it's in front of you know, 20 people or 20,000 it's always the same everybody tries all the time and you know it's not oh well this is doesn't matter what we do here. Or there was never. There was always a very professional attitude on stage with with, uh, with mm. What was the difference between the sessions you did in the studio and the <coughs> and being on stage? Well, I suppose the audience is, is the main difference. Instant feedback. Mm. Uh, in the studio, you get you can to a certain extent get feedback from um, other musicians, perhaps, but. Also, in in the studio, you you're often it shouldn't be like that, but you're trying to get things right more often because you know it's going to go down on tape, and you don't want to spoil, especially in the days when the when uh, bands recorded live more yes. or less, not so much in the overdubbing days, but in, in when they recorded live, because if you make a mistake and it's a really good take, mm. you have to do the whole thing again. Mm. <coughs> so you try not to make a mistake. On stage, you don't care. You can take chances because you know that once it's gone, mm. unless it comes back on a DVD 30 years later, <laughs> it's gone, you know. Mm. <laughs> and so you, on stage you tend to, you can be pushed, f you can go further on stage. Mm. It's freer. And then plus the feedback from the audience, so that can, that can result in a really, really good concert, mm. really good presentation. You mentioned before that the press didn't know much about you. Right. But then you had a lot of bad press. How, how come? What, what? I don't know. I don't know what it was. It was the first bad press took us completely by surprise. 
um, which was the, the, the Rolling Stone review for the first album. And they said, and it's band, I think it's, they mentioned the word hype. And we thought, they're listening to the wrong album. <laughs> this is the wrong band. They've made a mistake with the review. Because the, the, the one thing that Led Zeppelin wasn't was hyped. You know, it wasn't a manufactured band in that, that sense. Everybody was, were really good musicians. We were very dedicated. We weren't pretentious. We weren't pompous. We could, we knew, we could do it. You know, we really could do it. We could. Mm. We were all. Uh, and we didn't know who they were talking about. And it was like, do they mean us? Mm. And I don't know why they may have, you know, presumably had their own reasons. Mm. And most bad press, because we didn't do bad shows. The shows were really good. Mm. Um, most bad press seemed to be for some some other agenda, you know, you, you couldn't quite understand it. Mm. Even though you, you, you turn out to be bigger than Rolling Stones, mm. Stones still were on the cover of the music magazines. Mm. Maybe it had something to do with it, the, the, the fact that um, they weren't, I don't know, it sounds petty, it can't be the reason, but sometimes I think that because the press didn't really have much of a hand in making us in the first place, mm. perhaps they felt that we were standoffish or, or something. Of course, as soon as started, we started getting bad press, then we were definitely standoffish, you know. <laughs> Why talk to people who slag you, mm. slag you off all the time? And, mm. uh, and then I suppose the rift maybe widened or was cemented, you know. But, um, yes, in some cases it took till, I don't know, 1990 before we got good press mm. <laughs> again. <laughs> and suddenly we're heroes, heroes of the grunge movement, you know, so. go mm. figure. But it never really made much difference to us. Now, it's, it's hurtful when you, when you know that you did a really good concert and they'll... I produced an album for The Mission once. Yeah, Carved in Sand. Yeah, uh, no, Children. Yeah, Children, sorry. Children. And I read a review in New Musical Express or something like that, and the whole review was how they hated Wayne Hussey. There was nothing about the record at all. <laughs> and I thought, mm. and this is his review. This is his record review. And they didn't own them, by the way. You know. There's ten tracks or something. That's all they said. <laughs> it's like, why? Why bother? You know, if you don't like the guy, don't write about him. Mm. You know, it's like it's crazy. But sometimes the press are like that. So mm. And yet there's some really good journalists who really understood the music and really got into it mm. and wrote great reviews. You know, not always good reviews. You know, sometimes if they thought that night wasn't particularly good, they'd say so. But if it's an honest criticism, you go, yeah, you're right, I know. <laughs> how, the, the man who led Zeppelin, how important was Peter Grant? Very, very important. Um, he believed in us right from the word go. Uh, he had, basically what he did was say that, I'll take care of the business and all out, outside distractions and I'll keep them away from you. And you just get on with the music. And he said, you do it your way, I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to tell you you should do this or do that, or you, you're musicians, you do the music. I manage, that's what I do, and, I, and, and that's what he did. He just cleared this big space around us. Mm. I was talking to Armit Ertigan years later, who said, we weren't even allowed to, we were afraid to come near you in case Peter got angry with us, you know. And they weren't, they weren't at the recording, you know, studios. They weren't allowed to hear the music until we were. It was absolutely finished. I mean, it was um, it was a unique state of affairs. But it was very artistically, it was, it was the best you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. But he 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 was in a, in a way he he had loads of innovations when it came to manage a rock and oh, roll yeah. band. Yeah. What yeah. But well, it? he had a very simple premise that um, that the whole. The whole business relied on the, on the band, relied on the artist. So all you've got to do is keep the artist happy, and then everything else will fall into place. And I don't mean you know, mm. run and do things for the artist, but, but make sure that the artist got paid properly for his work, and make sure the artist was treated properly. Mm. And then everybody would benefit. You know, mm. The promoters, so everybody would benefit. And he, well, at the time he thought of this. Nobody else was doing it. You know, the artists were getting screwed right, left and centre and, you know, treated like animals and everybody was bitching at everybody else, you know. And mm. But he came along and said, look, you know, pay them, treat them properly, put them in 
good places to play and you know, mm. be professional about it. It's quite simple. It wasn't rocket science in that way. Mm. He was just brave enough to push it through. There's a lot of people who were used to taking huge rake-offs mm. in concerts and, and, uh, and they didn't like it. But he said, look, if you, know, if you don't like it, then book another band. Mm. He, was the, he was that confident and it mm. worked. There were good times and bad times. And how did the, the periods when when drugs came in to the to some members in the band, how did you struggle with that or how did you manage to Well deal nobody with knew it? that much about managing them, as it were, in those days. You know, it wasn't the age of therapy or <laughs> rehab. <laughs> that came twenty years too late for us. But uh, as long as it didn't interfere with with the music and with stage work, mm. then we kind of had to leave it at that. You know, you can't really go meddling in other people's lives, I suppose. And it didn't interfere with the, with the, with the music and the stage work. I mean, occasionally you get a hangover that would, <laughs> would roll into stage, but soon, you know, they... There, there was a, a fairly transparent re relationship all the time and, you know, You'd feel the odd one out if you turned up under the weather in any way, you know. And I don't know. It's it was kept off stage, I suppose. Mm. You did a lot of work on on Improve Your Outdoor, recorded in right. in my hometown, Stockholm. Right. Mm, yes. Wasn't it particularly bad at the time? Um, it was probably yes. It probably rose to a head then. But the upshot was that, that we put out a good album of the people who were who were there doing it. <laughs> you know, Robert and I were at the rehearsals first. Unfortunately, I well not unfortunately. Fortunately, I, I just um, taken delivery of this big Yamaha organ synthesizer thing. I mean, mm. it was three keyboards and full pedal board, and so as is always the way with me, I was very inspired with this new instrument. Mm -hmm. So I just started writing stuff and I had it delivered to the rehearsal rooms and I was there early playing it. Yeah. And then Robert turned up next and by the time Bonzo and Jimmy had turned up, we kind of finished the album, not written most of the album. And that's how that happened. And uh, it was sort of, it was really done before we went, went into the studio, and then we went to the studio and, uh, and put it down. But uh, not much changed from the rehearsal to the studio. Mm. Whereas normally the writing, um, the writing process with Led Zeppelin is, is that an idea would start with any member of the band, mm. perhaps, and then everybody would work on that 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 idea mm. and became Zeppelin property, as it were. How did you feel, John Paul, when when everything ended, and especially ended in the way it did? Well, it was terrible. It was a terrible shock. Um, we knew immediately that it, that was the end of Zeppelin. John Bonham wasn't the drummer of Led Zeppelin. He was a quarter of Led Zeppelin. And um, you couldn't just say, oh, get another drummer. You know? A, you'd never find anybody like him. But B, it wouldn't be the same band in the slightest. You know? It wasn't a song-based band. The, um, the way uh, the music was created was um, sort of on a, on a continual basis and on stage it was there's a lot of improvisation and uh, but even in the studio the way it was played was what it was about it wasn't an arrangement of a song where you could have any musicians come in and play and it would sound still like the same song mm -hmm. so but Unfortunately, it, it happened at a time when we'd gone through perhaps a l the lowest period at the end of the 70s. And Robert had lost his son, and I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't good times for us. But then after Nebworth, there was this new optimism in the band. And we were rehearsing for an American tour when, when John, John died. And so there was, there was a feeling that, you know, it's 1980, new decade, and you know, this, and then we punk had come and gone a bit and so now we were all a bit leaner and you know, musically a bit, bit more sharp, bit sharper again. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it just it just all stopped, you know. Mm. But uh, it was terrible. Mm. 
As being one quarter of the band, as you say, that John was, is it possible for you to, to play again together? What, three quarters? <laughs> you could call it three quarters, I suppose. <laughs> no quarter. <laughs> After no quarter, <laughs> three quarters. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't... I, who, who knows? Who knows? Maybe, but it wouldn't be Led Zeppelin. There's no way it would be Led Zeppelin. Okay, uh, I have one more question about... Uh, uh, or do we have... Yeah. Uh, the one of your biggest songs, or I mean the, one of the most played songs of mm. yours, is, is Stairway to Heaven. Mm -hmm. How do you... What's, what does that song mean to you? Well, it has... <coughs> it's, it's kind of a Led Zeppelin sampler, isn't it? <laughs> it has everything that we do in it somewhere. Mm. You know, it starts off, with, starts off quietly with the acoustic instruments and then it goes into a sort of mellowish, almost jazzy vibe with keyboards and that and... Uh, then the rock and roll starts, you know, <laughs> the solos, and, it's, and the song has a really nice dynamic, long dynamic, and with, you know, with a bit in the middle, and then there's changes gear towards the end. I mean, it's got everything, really. It's just, uh, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the, the mystical lyrics, you know, that nobody's quite sure of what they mean, but including Rob Robert. <laughs> Robert Plant doesn't seem to, to like it. No, he doesn't. I don't know why. <laughs> what maybe, do you think? maybe he knows what the lyrics mean. He doesn't like the lyrics. I don't know why. I think it's good. You know, maybe he feels he's sung it too often. I'm, I'm not sure why he doesn't like it. But you're right. He doesn't. <laughs> but I disagree with him. I think it's good. Mm. Did you feel at the time that this this <coughs> is a is a possible milestone of rock? I don't know. I, I don't think in terms of milestones of rock myself. Um, it was obviously a good, you know, Page had this long, this idea of this long number that had different changes in it. Mm. And it was, it was obviously going to be something good and something very interesting, something not done before really anywhere else. So there was, I can't think of anything else that it was like at the time. Um, and it certainly, when you finish a track, you know how successful they are as to what you were aiming for, as to what was finally realised, which is really the only way you can judge um, music, recorded music especially. Um, and it was very successful. It did all the things we wanted mm. with the arrangement and, uh, and everything else. Um, you know, as I said, it had this great dynamic and the solo at the end and then the final chorus. It's just, you know, it was great pop music, apart from anything else. Never mind rock. Mm. <laughs> so Did that f capture that song? Uh, this, uh, like, from the from the very beginning, with "Babe, I'm gonna uh, leave you." That was similar, yeah. That yeah, was probably with the light side and the dark yeah, side, yeah. the blues side and the folk Page side. always had that in mind when, um, but he, he, he would also. I mean, we were all good musicians, and so we knew the value of dynamic and light and shade, mm -hmm. you know, to set one off against the other, uh, which is why we didn't sound like other bands, because other bands seem to just do light or shade, <laughs> never, <laughs> never can you know, in the same song. You, know, you have a slow song or a fast one, or and, it's, and, and to me that, that that's boring. Plus, you ignore really valuable musical dynamics, etc., etc., etc. But um, Page always had this, he used to work out a lot of the heavy riffs on the acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it was kind of interchangeable. All he had to do was orchestrate the, the guitar lines and suddenly it was... But it's fascinating to, to have a, an ID which comes from one, uh, one song, which you develop into all, all that you did. Yes. Because you brought in so much into it with yeah. different yeah. music But also styles. we were able to bring so much into it. We're all very able musicians with um, wide influences and wide abilities mm -hmm. in different sorts of music. And so you, we could make that variation. I mean, there's some bands simply can't do it. You know, you wouldn't know what to play. What do you like, Kashmir, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah. I like, um, yeah. It's a big favorite of mine, Kashmir. Yeah? Well, I didn't write it. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kashmir was a great showpiece as a, as a number. Mm. Uh, 
it was just it was very theatrical and uh, very, the grand gesture and it was uh, but then so was when the levee breaks in its own way you know but just less orchestral I suppose more bluesy but great atmosphere especially on the record the atmosphere on the levee is it's amazing what's your own favorite I have lots of favorites all for different reasons if you just you know the desert island it's hard to say Ooh, the Desert Island one. I know Kashmir is pretty good. But then things like What Is and What Should Never Be is it's really good. The way the, the rhythm comes and the drums come in. When the drums come, it's magic, that sudden mm. changing of gear. Mm. All the, the uh, I have to ask you also about all the the, the rumors about the, the great myth and legend about uh, Led Zeppelin as mm. being the the Crusaders who came and smashed hotels and uh, uh you have a few parties and they remind you of it in 30 years time I mean you know <laughs> <laughs> what but I mean you've got nothing else to talk about <laughs> not come on a few well, parties didn't John Bonham come to your hotel room door once and he was taking a, a big sword and smashed the door and dragged you out of bed and left you in the hotel. Maybe. Maybe he did. But does that make him any less of a drummer? <laughs> I mean, or a man. So I didn't notice. Mm. <laughs> so uh, the funny thing was that they, they, they looked at somebody else's room and said, oh, and this room's smashed up as well. And we said, no, that belongs to the road manager. His room always looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> to Richard Cole. To Richard Cole, <laughs> yeah. 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 So no, no, it's, it's okay that one. Mm. So at the time when all this ha happened, you didn't feel that there was something strange going on. There wasn't anything strange. Every band used to. The first hotel room I ever saw broken up was Herman's Hermits. <laughs> I toured <laughs> with them in Germany. <laughs> Peter Noon smashed something. I was, I was shocked. <laughs> this is sort of smiley guy. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but. Uh, that wasn't the interesting thing in Led Zeppelin for me, I have to say. Mm. Why do those things happen? I mean, like, uh, well, you know, of course... Yeah, well, especially in the early days, you'd, um, you'd do a show, you'd do play for two hours or something like that, and mm. you'd be like this, you come back to the hotel and the town is closed. <laughs> the town closed round about the third number, you know? Mm. Kansas City shut, or wherever it was. Cincinnati, Ohio, I mean, I think it's still shut, Cincinnati, you know? And, and you just mm, high spirits, there's no food, there's no nothing to do, the television, two channels, they've all gone off, you know. So there's a practical side of it. There yeah. is a practical side of it, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of energy to ex to explore. You've got to wind down somehow. And sometimes we wound down noisier than others. Mm. And of course, I'm, I mean, like, when you came to the US, as you were quite young at the time as well, but mm. there was, of course, that feeling, but also the feeling of being number one, which you... Mm. The, the huge success of yours. Yeah. But why, why would that have anything to no, do with No, but I mean, like, else? doesn't it, it all give bands you... Just a party. Yeah, well, but we not all bands we are... We could. Not all bands are number one. You think it's... No, but, but you don't, you know. You don't go wild just because you feel you're number one. Mm. How was the feeling of being number one? Well, I, it's, I, I felt I was kind of slightly re removed from the feeling of, you know, of you read about the concert and you think, that's great, you know, wow, this band did really well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you don't feel it's you somehow. Mm. Um, because the feeling on stage was always the same, as I said, from the from the early small shows to the big ones. Uh, and so you you didn't really f feel that you know, we were on any, any sort of pedestal or any you know or any deity or anything like that. It was just oh, you liked it. Okay, great. <laughs> but someone <laughs> came up, more. <laughs> come up to you, hey, John Paul, you're bigger than the Beatles. Well, I'd say they were a bit silly. That's, that wasn't true, though, was it? And the Beatles were household names. They had hit singles. They were on TV. They made films. You know, we couldn't really be. But in the rock world, I suppose, mm. yeah, I suppose we were. You know. Thank you very much, Kipia. John Paul, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's great talking to you. Thank and you. Uh, by the way, nice production work also with 
the mission album. All right, I, thank you. At the time, I interviewed both uh, Craig Adams <coughs> and Wayne Hussey. All right. So <laughs> I just got Wayne. the title wrong. Yes. Right, that was the one after. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. All right. And good luck Thank with you. your own further or forthcoming solo right. album. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come and see you again. I'll try yeah. and get play in Sweden. Yeah, you should. It can't be that hard. That's quite a few. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Although for the when we did the uh, Into the Outdoor. Yeah, I kept waking up late, and was, it was in December or something. So yeah. It was like dark for three weeks. We never yeah. saw the daylight at all. No, yeah. and, and you stayed there <laughs> like, like the weekdays, and then you went home. Just a night. On the weekend, yeah. yeah. The rest of it. That's what I was going to deny it. Lots of pretty fun on this. Yeah? Thank you. It's fatal. Oh, Prince Fatal. Huge, you remember that? Huge one? amounts. Oh, yes. shit. That's, that's disgusting.